Well, here we are, the final unit. Unit nine, globalization. This is easily the most overlooked unit of the entire AP World History Modern course. But check this out, 10% of the exam could be on this unit. You can't just skip past unit nine like it's just about smartphones and climate change. This is a deceptively large unit. And scrolling through that CED, which I will link one more time below, you kind of get the impression that the College Board higher-ups were just kind of throwing a bunch of stuff together at the end of the course. It's not very cohesive. But that's exactly what the Around the AP World in 80 Days countdown is here for. The staff here at Freemanpedia have has been combing through the finer points of globalization to give you just what you need to survive. So let's go. We're real close to the end here, guys. You can see the finish line from here. Today, let's review the advances in technology and exchange after 1900. This one requires no real setup. You know what technology is. Your whole life is technology. What generation are you guys from? You know what, let's ask someone from my class. Oh yeah, they left last week. Anyways, I'm pretty sure you guys are Generation Z. I am what's known as an x -ineal. We have a completely different view of technology. You were born with an iPad in your hand. I was 30 when the iPad came out. I'm old. But don't make the mistake of thinking this globalization technology section 9.1 is just about modern technology, the technology you have around you right now. This is still the contemporary period, which means 1900 to present. Technically, airplanes are new in this period. The College Board breaks the new technology in the contemporary period down into five different categories. First, communication. This one is easy. We are communicating. Imagine trying to explain what you're doing right now to someone from before 1900. Exactly. That's the level of change in communication that takes place in the contemporary period. I made a chart. Most of this is pretty obvious. Radio, telephones, cellular technology, and the internet exponentially increased the speed and amount of communication for humanity. Planes and automobiles made the world smaller by speeding up the rate at which people and goods could travel. But don't forget about shipping containers. That's right. Your clothes definitely spent some time in a shipping container. 90% of non-bulk items shipped overseas are carried in shipping containers like these. And as long as people don't keep getting their boat stuck in the Suez Canal, shipping containers will continue to be the main means of shipping goods around the planet. Second, energy. We spent some time in the last period, 1750 to 1900, talking about coal and the impact coal had on the Industrial Revolution. But here in the contemporary period, we're talking about two new ways of producing energy. Focus on petroleum and nuclear power. Petroleum isn't new, but with the advent of modern cars and trucking, it became way more important than in the 1800s. Plus, in a geopolitical sense, Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the United States are the three largest oil producers on the planet, with 80% of Earth's accessible oil reserves lying underneath Arab nations. And who controls access to the planet's oil reserves will give nations a strategic advantage that they may not have had in previous eras. The other new source of power is nuclear power. Only about 10% of Earth's power comes from nuclear, and debates rage over its impact. On the one hand, it's way more friendly on the environment than coal. On the other hand, accidents like Three Mile Island in the United States and Chernobyl in the Soviet Union, along with how to deal with nuclear waste, offers their own set of challenges. Third, birth control. You may have noticed that the population of the planet just keeps going up. That's also a big trend in the contemporary period, the increase in the number of people that are alive on the planet at the same time. Earth reached its first billion people in the middle of the last era in 1804. Two billion people? 1927. Three billion people? 1960. Four billion people? 1974. Five billion people? 1987. Six billion people? 1999. Seven billion people? 2012. Eight billion people? Yeah, we haven't got there yet. But current estimates say there will be eight billion people on the planet in the year 2027. Now, there have only been about 110 billion people ever in existence. So eight billion on the planet at one time is a decent sized chunk of all the humans who've ever lived. One way to counter this is birth control. Birth control was initially outlawed in the United States back in the 1800s until pioneers like Margaret Sanger in the early contemporary period fought for a woman's right to have birth control. And after meeting Margaret Sanger at a dinner party, Dr. Gregory Pincus worked to create the birth control pill. His research found that a certain hormone inhibited ovulation. In 1960, the FDA approved the pill. Fourth, agriculture. Okay, this is code. The only thing they actually mention here for agriculture is really the most important thing maybe to ever happen, and that's the Green Revolution. In the 1950s and 60s, humanity almost ended. And not because of all that duck and cover, Cold War, fallout garbage your teacher was talking about. We almost ran out of food. So. Who could save the planet? Norman Borlaug. Never heard of him, huh? Well, 
you're alive because of him, so show some respect. He is the father of the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution was the introduction of higher yield crops through pesticides, crossbreeding, and chemical fertilizers. And that reminds me, I need to say goodbye to an old friend. Let's have a moment of silence for guano. Guano, you were easily the funniest part of the AP curriculum. The fact that poop played such a large role in feeding the planet was hilarious to me. Also, without your important poop qualities, America would be a much smaller empire today. In fact, without guano, we never would have taken the island of Midway. Without Midway, we never would have won World War II. Thank you, Guano, for being gross, making me laugh, and saving the planet from Imperial Japan. You will be missed. Fifth, medicine. It's weird to even bring this up, but before 1900, medicine was not great. Maybe as many as half or more of you would be dead if it weren't for the medical innovations of the contemporary period. So when it comes to medicine after 1900, focus on these two innovations, antibiotics and vaccines. Antibiotics are used worldwide and are exactly what they sound like. Vaccines, on the other hand, had their roots all the way back in the 1700s with Edward Jenner and his smallpox vaccine. That's literally where we get the name now. Vache is French for cow. You definitely have some vaccines coursing through your veins right now. How do I know? Check out this chart. These are the diseases you don't have because of vaccines. Tuberculosis, diphtheria, whooping cough, yellow fever, typhus, influenza, polio, anthrax, measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox, pneumonia, meningitis, hepatitis B, hepatitis A, Lyme disease, rotavirus, HPV, malaria, Ebola, dang fever. So the next time you see some idiot online spouting pseudoscience about vaccines, ask them how their polio is doing or if their tuberculosis is flaring up this week. The length, quality, and standard of living of all humans on the planet has been improved by the advances in medical science and technology in the contemporary period. That's it, pretty simple, right? A lot of stuff that directly affects you every single day. The last thing I mentioned though, medicine, don't think we've cured everything. Guess how many diseases have been completely eradicated from the planet? You're wrong, it's two. The aforementioned smallpox and renderpest. It's kind of poetic that since cows kind of saved us from smallpox, we saved them from renderpest. Renderpest was a disease that affected cows. Speaking of diseases, what were the major diseases that affected and threatened humanity in the contemporary period? See you tomorrow. Thank you.